you know, as I said, I'm a sort of merchant of danger for the afternoon because our next speaker again is going to speak about a phenomenon that we're really blind to. And while we're preoccupying ourselves with the much more understandable and comprehensible uh, dangers of an airstrike between India and Pakistan, imminent upon us are much larger phenomenon which are going to overtake us and it requires a kind of prescience so in many ways both of them are soothsayers of our time and we would do well to tune into what they're talking about. Guy Standing is an economist who began to think about this phenomenon almost 30 years ago. He's come up with a term called the precariat which pretty much explains the kind of political phenomenon that, again, is a transnational phenomenon. It's not just America's problem, it's not just Britain's problem, it's not just India's problem. It is a common phenomenon that is sweeping across the world, and it is a psychological state of being, which is precariousness and anxiety. When he first started speaking about this, much like Amitav Ghosh is in the throes of despair, Guy Standing was in the throes of despair because nobody was listening to him. They thought he's a crazy man. He didn't have the kind of standing in the academic circles that he deserves. But today, Nobel laureates, corporates, governments, people of all hues and across spectrum, leftists, rightists, centrists, are all asking for him. They're all engaging with him, and they're all asking him for solutions. So ladies and gentlemen, we are very proud to have Guy Standing here to explain to us what is this phenomenon that he intuited way before any of us were looking at it and how it's impacting all of us. Thank you for being here, Guy. So first up, I'm sorry, like I'm sounding like I'm on a bullet train, but Mr. Modi is going to be coming and we are kind of running behind time. So it's, it's uh, good that you speak fast and furiously. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Guy, many people are not familiar with this term precariat. Once you enunciate it, it seems self-evident, but can you explain to us what is this phenomenon and why did you call it the precariat? Well, thank you very much. It's great to be back in India. I've been working in India on and off for 30 years, and this phenomenon is, is real in India as it is in all parts of the world, as Shoma has said. Since I wrote the precariat in 2011, I've been asked to talk about it in over 400 places in over 40 countries. And every single day, I get dozens, if not hundreds, of emails from people who say, this book is about me. And what it's about is that we are in the middle of a global transformation. It's very relevant to the last subject that you were discussing, as I'll try and make clear in a moment. The global transformation is about the painful construction of a global market system. And the first period was dominated by neoliberalism, the Mont Pelerin Society, and all of those things that you know. And essentially, it was an extension of free market principles. Many in this room will support free markets. We had a liberalization, but in the process, actually, we've seen the construction of the most unfree market economy ever conceived. And the real problem that we're facing is a problem of rentier capitalism, whether the return to property and assets exceeds anything else. So a tiny plutocracy has emerged, sucking rental income out of the rest of the world, in every part of the country, I'm coming to the precariat, and the existence of a class fragmentation process globally means we have a plutocracy and an elite at the top with rentier incomes, a shrinking old proletariat, and a growing precariat underneath. And the precariat consists of millions and millions of people who are facing a life of bits and pieces, unstable lives of labor in which they don't feel they have an occupational narrative, an occupational identity, and they're having to rely on low and volatile money wages. They're not getting access to rights-based state benefits or non-wage enterprise benefits and they feel like denizens, not citizens. They're losing access to rights. And fundamentally, in this sort of very brief session, 
What I've perceived as the problem is that we have a breakdown of the 20th century, the last century, the 20th century income distribution system. It's not the Piketty story, but it's a story in which more and more of the income is going to an elite, and those relying on labor are having a shrinking share. So I'm just going to step in here, Guy, to ask you one thing, that there's often a kind of confusion around, as I said, people are not very familiar here with the word precariat, but you would have come across that confusion, that people think that this is just a working class problem. This is a labor class problem, a construction workers problem, and that the audience here doesn't need to connect with that. You've spoken of it as a psychological condition that cuts across class. You know, it could be people sitting here, it's white collar workers, it's blue collar workers. Please explain that psychological condition to us. I call it a mixture of the precariatized mind. If you're in the precariat, you have to do a lot of work that doesn't get counted as labor. You don't know what it is that you should be doing to give yourself a strong chance of having social mobility or economic security. And one of the worst aspects which connects with the last subjects is that in the last 30 years, we've seen an erosion of the commons, access to public amenities, access to public resources, which affects the precariat more than any other group because they rely on the commons to give them a sense of stability. And one of the really strong predicaments of this consciousness of being in the precariat is you feel you have no rights and you feel detached. And what I argued in the books uh, is that you have three groups within the precariat. You have one group which is falling out of the old working class into the precariat. They don't have a lot of education. They feel they've lost a past that their parents had or their communities had. And I said on page one of the first book, yeah. Yeah, I said on page one of the first book, that unless the insecurities of the precariat are addressed and the aspirations, we will see the emergence of a political monster. That was on page one. You will not be surprised that in November 2016, I received emails from all over the world from people who just wrote words to this effect, your monster has arrived. And what this means is that basically we have a danger that this group will be lured by populists and neo-fascist racists and xenophobic people who will play on their fears. And if they do so, we should not be surprised to see more authoritarian figures emerging. But we have to address those insecurities and understand, not to condemn, but understand and to provide a new politics which is addressing those insecurities. The second group in the precariat consists of people who have lost a sense of home. They've lost a sense of the present. And this group suffers from a relative deprivation that they have no home anywhere. They're the migrants, they're the minorities, they're the various groups. This group is dangerous because they feel detached from society. And we're seeing that all over the world, where m huge numbers of people are detached from our democratic process, detached from feeling they're members of society. And the third group, which is often the group that I get asked to address around the world, are the young and the more educated, often with parents like many of you, who are promised by their parents and by their teachers that if they go to university, they will have a future. But millions are coming out of university and college with no sense of future, but with one thing, unsustainable debt that drags them down and depresses them and leads to many mental disorders, suicides, attempted suicides. And this group is dangerous in that sense, an existential danger, but is also the great hope because this group won't support the Trumps or the neo-fascists elsewhere. They will look for a new politics of paradise. And this group doesn't condemn employers. They're gonna have different employers all over there. They are critical of the state. 
and they are angry because the state is not addressing the ecological crisis, the existential crisis, offering a, a politics and a set of policies that will produce security and a sense of future. And it is this group where I think we have the greatest set chance of success around basic income. I've been promoting basic income for 30 years. We've done pilots in Madhya Pradesh and West Delhi. I believe a basic income would work in India, but in many other parts of the world, it's the precariat that's demanding a basic income. So I'm going to come back to the solutions in a bit, Guy, but one of the things that really strikes you if you read Guy's book or engage with his thesis are exactly these things, that it's a psychological condition, it's a sense of anxiety and precariousness, instability, that a lot of us even sitting in this room would, would vibe with, and also that perhaps it's the first time in the world that Guy has spotted the creation of a class that cuts across class, you know, so he speaks about how it could be climate change, it could be robotization, it could be artificial intelligence, it could be politics and conflict, what the source of displacement is, it could be neoliberal policies, it could be the labor reform that we are always asking for, what that cause for instability and precariousness is, is ma manifold, but the end product is the class that he's describing and the impacts of that uh, class are cutting across all of us, whether it's in France or Putin or Brazil or America or India or Pakistan, anywhere. The political impacts of that are all very, very similar and follow a pattern. And now that brings us to the solution guy, which is fairly contested as well. You are a great advocate and as I said, 30 years back, you were talking about basic income. Everyone thought you're crazy. Nobody wanted to listen to you. Today, Rahul Gandhi is talking about a minimum income. Arvind Subramanian put out a white paper on basic income. If both sides would have it, BJP would put out a plan and uh, Rahul Gandhi would put out a plan and we'd be discussing only this if Pulwama strikes had not happened. So explain to us about basic income. Well, uh, imagine if you were in my place and for 30 years you've been advocating a particular idea and suddenly you get an opportunity to put that idea into practice, into reality. What's happened in Africa, we've been doing pilots in Africa, where we've given every man, every woman, every child a basic income. And then in 2009, I got an opportunity to work with Sewa and friends here in India, and we launched pilots in Madhya Pradesh and West Delhi where we provided thousands of men and women and children with a very modest basic income, without condition. And we said in those villages, we said, you can do what you like with the money. We're giving it to you. We're not telling you how to spend it. We're not telling you if you'll lose it if you don't spend it in certain ways. It's up to you. And I remember a very, 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 very senior politician in this country inviting us to explain. And this very, very, very senior politician said, you're mad. They're wasted on alcohol and tobacco, and they'll stop working. We said, why, would you do that? Would you do that? If we give you 300 rupees per person? You're not going to do that. These people are no different from you. So let's see. So over the course of several years, we provided every one of those villages with that money. And what we saw was that nutrition improved, health improved, health care improved, sanitation improved, work increased. Watch my lips. Work increased. Output, agricultural output increased. Women's status improved. The book has the data. And we saw this in action, and at the end of the several years, all the villagers said, please continue. And I kept going to the villages, and I said to myself, how come we're seeing all these things with just a modest amount? Hardly anything. 300 rupees per person. And then it struck me, and I've tried to explain that in several books, 
but it really was a lesson I learned from those villagers. The emancipatory value of a basic income is greater than the money value. Those of you who are economists here might be able to understand that. And the reason is this. In the low-income communities, money is a scarce commodity. And anybody who knows basic economics will know that if a commodity is scarce, the price goes up. So the villagers said there are one, there's one group in our communities which hate your scheme. They hate it. I said, we can't make everybody happy. And then they told us which group it was. It's the money lenders, they said. I said, I'm very sorry. And the reason is the price of money came down and they were reacting to their own liquidity and a sense of being slightly more in control of their lives. I was listening to the agricultural discussion. Why don't you trust people? They increased agricultural output. They increased the fertilizers. They bought seeds. They were selling more. They were making more income even though the prices went down because they were producing more. So you are setting up a dynamic which is actually very feasible. And what is wonderful in this country is you have the fiscal space to do this without affecting public health or public education. We should all believe in those things. So I'm, that's the point at which I'm going to come in and contest you, Guy. But because you mentioned about uh, agricultural output in the previous session, uh, again, this might be something that interests the audience. We are always talking about China and its manufacturing cycle. Uh, I don't know how many of us are familiar with the fact that China's land holdings are much less and much smaller than India. But because they spent and focused on agriculture to a huge degree, uh, their growth actually is being, is being fueled by agriculture now and they are twice or thrice or four times more productive than India because they believed and understood that agriculture was very, very central to their society. So, you know, everything we're discussing here is about focus and political priority. But coming to you, Guy, there are enough economists in India who are very worried about this phenomenon of basic income and direct money transfer. Because when you do it at a scale like India, you know, you've been doing small pilot projects, but it, at the scale that India operates, if you put all that money on the table, finally what will reach people is very, very small amounts. And already the welfare state is very rickety. So if you're going to get three, 400 rupees, you're going to get 1,000 rupees or 2,000 rupees as Mr. Modi's plan is, still when you fall ill and healthcare is not available to you, that 2,000 rupees is going to finish very, very quickly. So people are very anxious, not about the fact that people may stop working, but that they will still not get access to basic citizen rights. Uh, I, don't you think you're kind of building a rosy picture on this, which may go badly wrong? I think what makes me particularly unhappy when I come to India, a country I love and respect enormously, is that some of my old friends, economists from my Cambridge days, will write articles in newspapers based on complete, excuse me, complete ignorance. They haven't studied the pilots here or elsewhere. They haven't studied the theoretical and empirical evidence from around the world, and yet they have strong, strong opinions. I've read three articles in major newspapers since I've arrived back here in Delhi this week. And I, I, I say, well, where do you get this claim? Where do you get it? At least go we, and We live in a data unreliable uh, world. I know, but I mean, I, I say to economists that we have a responsibility. If we're going to have opinions, we should at least study what it is that we have opinions on. You wouldn't expect me to write an article on heart surgery and take me very seriously because I don't know anything about heart surgery. And I wouldn't, I hope, write an article about heart surgery because you shouldn't, this shouldn't read it. But that's what's happening. If you go out in the country, even if you're a foreigner like me, and you say to yourself, well, how many schemes have you got in India? I remember we had a research project in Gujarat. We said, how many social policy schemes exist in Gujarat? So we put a researcher on, and they had three months to find out. I've asked a lot of very knowledgeable Indian friends who should know. 
How many do you think exist in a state like Gujarat? 200, 300? 3,316 was the number we came up with. Many of those schemes, a whole lot of money goes in and nothing comes out in the clogged pipes. We all know that. We all know the PDS results in stale rice. I've seen women putting their rice rations from the PDS shop on mats in front of them and spend three hours in the sun taking out the stones because the stones have been put in there to make the weight. I've seen queues in ration shops where there's nothing in the bloody shop. Excuse, nothing, sorry, my English deteriorates. It's too French nothing. for us. <laughs> it's, but we know these things, it's nothing new. It's nothing new, and yet the state wastes vast sums of money and then says, no, we have no fiscal space to give the ordinary man and woman out there 300, 500 rupees a month? Please, come on. We can do it. We can do it. But it means you have to trust people and you have to mobilize. You need better public health. You need better public education. When my friends say, ah, oh, you've got, you're against those, that's rubbish. That's a caricature, straw man stuff. I think we ha we're in a transitional period in social policy and economic policy in which we have to look at life differently because this global transformation is making yesterday's truth today's untruth. And we mustn't try and go back to the 20th century. Today, and that's one of the great things about coming to India, the fresh thinking, the fresh thinking about innovation, entrepreneurship in many spheres. But when it comes to social policy, too many people are trapped in the old bureaucratic system. The bell's hitting me. The bell is hitting you, Guy. Uh, I'm sorry, we're going to have to end it there, but part of the pleasure of meeting people like Amitav Ghosh and Guy Standing is that they're posing the intellectual challenge and the creative challenge for everyone to think fresh. We are at that tipping point in history where there has to be a completely pivotal change, a pivotal thought change, and the things we are engaging with are the old stuff. We are circling an old pond when a whole new ocean has opened up somewhere else. And those oceanic forces are climate change, global displacement, migration, uh, you know, inequity, poverty. The things that we really look at is not our concerns, but they're coming at us, as I said, like a transcontinental, a transnational terror force that is posing a real life challenge to us. And it's a pleasure to have people like you to trigger our thinking. Thank you very much, guys standing. Thank you very much.